Morning Zion Church, morning YouTube. Another beautiful day God has bestowed upon us. It's beautiful for several reasons. The leaves are at their peak or maybe past their peak already in our area, and that's a beautiful thing. But also a beautiful day because God has given us a day, another day of life we're supposed to treat it. Not to take it as for granted, but treat it as a gift that God has given us. And we're called to make the most out of it. What I want to do is I'm going to get into my message, the word, right away. It's an it's a awesome parable. And I pray that we all learn something from it. And the Holy Spirit shows us what is in store that the word of God will reveal to each and every one of us. So I'm going to go into Matthew 20, 1 to 16. Matthew 20, 1 to 16. If I may read. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, go ye into the vineyard, whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. Now listen to this. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, why stand ye there all day idle? And they said unto him, because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, go also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, thou shalt receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came and supposed that they should have received more, they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received, it mustered against the good man of the house, saying, These that have wrought but one hour, thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, Friend, I, I did thee no wrong. This that now agree with me for a penny. Take thine what is and go thy way. I will give unto these the last as even unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? And I, eat, I evil because I am good. So that the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. That is so awesome. But let's get the perspective of what's going on here. It's a vineyard. A vineyard has a time and opportunity for the crop, the, the grapes to be plucked and pulled. Because if not, the, the fruit will spoil on the vine. So he needs to do quick things. He goes out. Now, unlike today... You don't go on and post an ad on Indeed. You don't call the temporary service. I say, send me 10 laborers. My, my vineyard's ready to be plucked. You had to go and do the physical and to go look for people to hire them. This is how difficult it was back then. But before we go any further, the message says, first verse says, the kingdom of heaven is that unto that is a householder. See, the Lord, know, knowing, and he knows all, and still does knows all, what's in man and woman's hearts, what truly is in their hearts. He knew that he would present it as a parable, one, because heaven, if you would explain heaven exactly what heaven is, man could have the, the mindset to comprehend it. It would be like, what's he talking about? So he breaks it down into current day events, a vineyard. Vineyards were still were plentiful, there still are. But back then it was really significant. But he also used parables to explain the truths of the kingdom to people that truly trusted and loved the Lord. To those that did not trust or rejected him, they would understand the parable. So back to the parable. The landlord goes out in the morning and hires people the very beginning of the day. They agreed to a fair day's wages. Now a penny, penny is King James, New King James is a denarii. So we'll go with, you know, either or. But what I did is I did some research because I'm thinking a penny. But now think about this, this is thousands of years ago. It would roughly equate to a fair day's wages. 
And because back then your wages mostly became what you ate and what you drank, you know, your bread, your food, so on and so forth. So they go out the third hour and see man standing around waiting for a job. And he gives them the opportunity to say, this is what I'll pay you a fair day's wages. Well, they have to agree to it, and they do. But here's the key. This is what's so cool about the word of God. This is so beautiful. The third hour. What's the significance of the third hour? And I'm like, the Lord showed me the significance. This is why we, when we look at the word and we see what God has in store. Well, we also know that the third hour, which would approximately be about 9 a.m. Because based on the calendar or the time frame back, that was midnight to midnight. And they would use sunrise as the time or start of the day, 6 a.m. roughly. So three hours after sunrise would be 9 a.m. But we know that it was very significant because this is the time that Jesus Christ went upon the cross. Mark 15, 25 says, and it was the third hour that they crucified him. God's word is so, listen to this. God's word is so interesting, it's almost that of a puzzle of life. That we must be willing to understand in order for the puzzle pieces to come together. That is a quote that God put upon my heart because that is man that looks or tries to dissect it based on his own intuition will never understand the word of God until God reveals it through the Holy Spirit what he must read and understand. Then we see the landlord go out in the sixth hour and hire more since the harvest was ripe and he didn't want to lose the harvest. This is his livelihood. His, his vineyard is his livelihood. That is what puts food on his family's table for the rest of his year. That vineyard that grows ripe, he spends all time, he nurtures it. You know, he plucks off the old branches that are no good, that don't produce fruit. He, hard, he feeds it, he waters it, whatever he has to do to make sure that it's ripe. But the sixth hour, which would be high noon, okay, when the savior of the world Hanging upon the cross for all mankind. The perfect, complete, unblemished lamb. Unblemished lamb. Without sin sacrifice to give all the opportunity for life. All. All. Let me go to there. The sixth hour darkness fell upon the land. And we see the ninth hour he commends his spirit to the father. Now let's talk about this. Luke 23, 44 to 47. If you don't want to look up, it's fine because I'm going to stay mostly in Matthew. Luke 23, 44 to 47 reads, And it was the sixth hour that there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried out in loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. I had to share this because I'm going to tell you right now, the significance of the sixth hour, the third hour, the ninth hour in this parable is significant because Jesus brought, Jesus already knew this was going to happen, that he would be betrayed and he would hang upon the cross for all mankind. So I just wanted to share that. It's not where I'm going with this, but it's beautiful. The word of God, a lot of people think, you know, it just has one purpose or one meaning or, or one revelation. But many times the word of God has multiple revelations. Want to review to us what's in store for us. The landlord is still not having enough laborers to bring the crop, the crop, the crop to harvest. Goes out the 11th hour, roughly 5 p.m. Listen to me, 5 p.m. They work till 6, one hour, 5 p.m. See, my friends, back then, unlike today, you didn't have unions tell bargaining for your wages. You didn't say, hey, we're going to work for this much. We're going to work this many breaks. We're going to have these benefits. We won't work these days, so on and so forth. You didn't have that. It was based on the man's word of integrity and a handshake. You went out and you agreed, and that's how you did it. So let's get the complete picture. I'm going to do some simple math for you real quick. We have many work in the third hour to the twelfth. My book, it's nine hours. 
Then we had some start three hours later, six hours. Then the 11th hour, one hour. Back to the word. So when even had come, was come, the Lord of the vineyard say up to the store, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. I love how God and his word justifies and makes things perfect and it's justice where, where man thinks the total opposite of the word of God. The word of God is the total opposite of what, what many people profess you know, whether it's a political campaign, whatever, the word of God, I vote based on what the word of God tells me I need to vote on. Not why I brought that up. Don't ask me why the Lord puts it on my heart. It's not my message. But again, the word of God is opposite of the things of the world. The world looks at pride, but Jesus calls us to be humble. The total opposite. The world tells us someone hurts you, wrongs you, Avenge. The word of God tells us we need to forgive or turn the other cheek, whatever you prefer. So we see it's time to pay the workers of the vineyard. And the most opposite thing happens. The man that worked nine hours, and it was the heat of the day. And you didn't have cooling bandanas. You didn't have air conditioning to go in. You didn't have Gatorade to replace your electrolytes. Yet to deal with it, you had water, you had maybe shade from a tree, that was it. So the man at work nine hours, exhausted, sweaty, mess, dirty, you know, you got marks of him working, so on and so forth. Then you see the man at work one hour, didn't even break a sweat. He looks as good and fresh as he did when he first started. He worked one hour, didn't break a sweat, didn't get dirty, but yet receives the same pay that is the man that was sweaty, dirty, tired, and pretty much disgusted. It happens. Matthew 20, 24 to 28, if I may read. It's going to tie it all together. You're going to see it going to go a couple different directions, but the word of God is so perfect. And when the ten heard it, they moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called unto them and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercised dominion over them. And they are the great exercise authority over, upon them. But it shall not be among you. But whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be the chief among you, let him be your servant. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life for ransom for many. James and John's mom, and I, and, I, and I talked about this not too long ago. She thought she would do her beloved perfect angels the right thing and go to Jesus and say, they deserve to be at the right and the left, not knowing what she was requesting. But we see that she was full of pride for her own sons. And so the sons play along and they're going along and I'm saying, yeah, we could fit in, we could do what we're called to do. But what we want to see Jesus says it's the opposite. The man that thinks he's a leader not needs to become a minister or a servant. A pastor, me, or anyone that preaches the word of God is not to be held higher. A lot of religions hold their leader higher above than, than the people they preach or teach. It's wrong. They are called to be a servant. A minister is a servant. Amen? Amen. All right. But not, we only see James and John, but we see the, the 10 left. They're upset. How dare those two guys go to our beloved friend and say, we deserve more than them. So now they're upset. So now the walls go up of jealousy, of envy, of hatred. And it shouldn't be, but now here's the most important part I want you to catch. James and John and the other 10 did not have the presence of their heart. Spirit, you must understand this. The Holy Spirit would have said, Hold on, James and John, put your pride at the door. You know, you and they would have got convicted, as well as the other 10, because Jesus was still in their presence. And we know when he went to take his rightful place at the Father, they became united for each other for the kingdom of God. They didn't worry about who was going to be at the right and the left, they worried about preaching the gospel. To get the word out. Amen. 
It's already in my We see the laborers, I am telling you, they work very hard, very long, probably curse the landowner. Trust me, I've been a man for most of my life where people curse me many a times because I had to do what I was called to do. They cursed the landowner because they thought, how dare you, I work nine hours, but yet the landowner did exactly what they agreed to. I will pay you this for a fair, fair day's wages for a fair day's work, and that's what they did. But yet they thought they owe more. See, man's ways are always the opposite of what God wants for us. They thought they were owed more, but they weren't owed more. He dealt fairly to those that worked nine and six hours. But here's the cool thing. He dealt generously to those that one worked one hour. That's how the Lord works. Matthew 6, 31 to 34 reads. Matthew 6, 31 to 34 reads. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows the things you need. Here it is. This, this word all comes together. But seek ye, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for, the, for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought of, its, of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The scripture reference is for us to walk, have a walk of faith. Walk of life to show the most important aspect of what is in our lives. You know, if we worry about everything, worry about who's going to get voted into office. God already knows who's going to be voted into office. Obviously, sovereign. I'm this, you know, he's omniscient. He, he's got everything. He knows it all. Like a lot of people think they know it all. Total opposite. But I do understand that if you work nine hours, you get you would expect to get paid more than one work one hour. But they agreed to the terms. They agreed to the terms. The word says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else will fall into place. Wow. That should be posted in our on a refrigerator or or in our car dashboard or something because that puts things in perspective. What holds us back from this practice? What holds man and woman back from this practice by seeking first the kingdom of God? Ourselves. Ourselves getting in the way. It happens. Our own life. We focus on things that maybe aren't so significant or are not looking forward to the heavenly inheritance. Our faith, our lack of faith. Now let me correct this, this is so important. When I say lack of faith, I'm not talking faith to know and believe and confess upon Jesus Christ as your savior. But many people that confess and believe in Jesus Christ that they're short of salvation. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times we don't have the faith to know when things come forward, we cower rather than relying upon him. A lot of times it shows us where we stand. And this is why it's so important. We, you know, the word says we're called to examine ourselves because it shows us where we stand. Trust me, even as a pastor and a minister of God's word, I fall the traps at times looking at things more in a worldly sense than a godly sense. It happens. It's human nature. But when we trust upon the Lord each and every morning and day and afternoon and, and evening and know that, yes, this physical thing I'm dealing with will pass or I'll pass. Okay. There's no fear when someone trusts upon the Lord. The world lives in fear. Amen. Amen. Okay. Matthew 28 says, So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith on his store, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning with the last and the first. So check this out. The store, he was the Lord's right-hand man. He pays them, and lie of them receives a day's wages. Total opposite of what they thought and expected. He starts paying them from the last that came in the hour before, 
So the people in line at the end are the ones that were there first. Now, not only are they getting paid last, they're waiting longer to get paid. But this goes far deeper than a lesson of humility. Let's look at the scripture for more to learn. Matthew 19, 27 to 30 reads. Matthew 19, 27 to 30 reads. Then answered Peter and said, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have there for? Boy, I want you to remember that. This is so important. And Jesus said, And verily I say unto you, That which you have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit at the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. I love the word of God. It is so perfect. It puts man and woman in their proper place. The power to know the Lord is Jesus Christ, the Lord of life, the Lord who gives all that trust and confess upon him salvation, the best gift one can ever obtain. But many man and woman think that the fact, that this is important, that being a Christian longer than recent convert that they should have more rights or more rewards than the new believer. Wow, that's not what God preaches and tells us. This is most that more they do for their religion and will have so much more than the one that does not do anything. It's not how long one is a believer in Jesus Christ. It could be 80 years or a day. A life that we have been given through Jesus Christ by confessing and believing upon him. The reward is just to all that confess and believe upon him. It doesn't mean 80 years. It could be one day. We all will get the same reward. Eternal life with Jesus Christ. Do you understand how significant and beautiful the word of God, but more importantly, how just and fair our Lord really is? It's beautiful. Because God being so perfect, full of grace and mercy, has afforded all the same op opportunity for a heavenly reward. John 3, 16, 17. Y'all know, but I'm going to put it in there just to spice it up. For God so loved the world. There it is. The world. He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There it is. It's the promise. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Might be saved. He could have came and condemned the world like he did with the raging waters for the times of Noah, but he didn't. He is full of grace and mercy. He wanted man to afford the opportunity, the best gift ever. That is coming to knowing Jesus Christ. That's the beautiful thing. Yet we see Peter, go back to Peter, who loved the Lord as much as anyone. No one can argue that. Shared the gospel with the Jews. Of course, this is after Jesus left and he was filled with the Spirit. And even out of love and respect for his Savior, for his Messiah, for the, the line of Judah, for the King of Kings, for the Lord of Lords. His time to be crucified, it's, it's believed that he said, I cannot be crucified the way my Lord and Savior that I love with all my heart was crucified. He was crucified upside down. That's a beautiful thing. But Peter, full of himself, just like many times we are. Listen to this. Peter says, I left my fishing boat. Man, Lord, I left my profession. I love fishing. I was good at it. I left my family. I left my friends because I had to serve you, Jesus Christ. And I became an apostle for you. Listen to this. But a side note, Peter was not, I want to make sure we know this, Peter was not this time filled with the Holy Spirit. 
but the presence of Christ. So he still had too much Peter in him and not enough of Christ. Question you got to answer yourself. Do you have too much of you yet and not enough Christ? That's the question we have to ask. And how do we get it? We ask God to, that we will walk in obedience, walk in, and live for what we are called to be and be worthy of our calling. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. We struggle with many things because we totally do not put self aside. You could say, man, I put myself aside all the time for the kingdom. You're way better than I am. The key to a walk in Christ, we need to have our hearts open and be honest with him. Peter challenges the king of kings. Listen to this. He's going. He knows. He confessed that he was the son of God. He was the Christ, the anointed one. He knows it, but yet, boy, he was bold. He goes and says, hey, Jesus, what's in it for me? I want to know what my cut is. I want to know if I'm getting paid more than these other 11. He wants to know. He challenges God. God's only son, it just blows my mind, but it's cool. It's a purpose. It's a purpose. I have given up most everything, and it's time for my payout. What is my pay since I have given up so much, as many have given up so little? What does that mean? A lot of times we compare ourselves to someone else, say, you know what? I get up every Sunday early. I'm here early every Sunday and I'm at church every Sunday and I go to Bible studies and I read the word and I share the word and I pass out tracts and I even go in the corner and shout hallelujah. But yet we compare. We're not called to do that. We do it because we do it for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. What's the pace since I gave him so much? But here's the cool thing. You know, if you would have read this, you would have thought Jesus is going to, hey, Satan, get behind him. But he didn't. He gave him the promise that he will be on one of the 12 uh, thrones that will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow, that's as big as it gets. He is getting his payout. But yet, it's a beautiful thing. Now to you. Now to anyone. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? People don't like when I ask that all the time because it makes them think that, well, maybe you don't think, I, well, I, I'm not saying that. I, as a pastor and sharing of the gospel, must make it certain that I invite, as the Spirit tells me, to invite people, whether they're watching, whether they're here, whether they walk off the street, to know, to have the opportunity on which God loves them and have the opportunity for salvation. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Only a man or woman that trusts and believes upon Jesus Christ as your Savior is giving salvation. Period. Nothing else added. Nothing else subtracted. The reward goes all to confess and believe upon him. Now, a lot of people think reward. Many believers will be rewarded differently. There's an opportunity for five pounds. I'm not talking about that, that now. I'm talking about the reward of eternal life that goes to all that trust the Lord. Let's go to Romans 6, 6 and 11. 6, 6 to 11. Romans 6, 6 to 11. This ties it together. Know this, our old man is crucified with him, and the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Pretty simple so far. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now we be dead with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more, no more dominion over him. For in, the di- for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But he that liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you understand? And this is where the rubber meets the road, as we say. The significance of what we have been given. This is what God is telling me to preach. That we must understand and and. Just take in how blessed we truly are. Most people in churches don't realize how blessed they are. That's sad. That's sad. 
That's sad, but again. All right. We have been given life. I'm not talking this life. I'm talking a spiritual life. Physical life will come and go and pass. We know that. That's important that we understand it. But we, when we have Christ, we have the presence of his precious Holy Spirit within. My past, listen to this, I'm going to tell you. My past was dead to sin. My life was dead before I gave my life to Christ. Just like you all, once you give your life to Christ, your past is dead. Your sin is dead. You now live for the Lord. Hallelujah. How precious that truly is. Okay, let's go ahead. Back to my scripture I read. And, and everyone that has forsaken houses or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and they that are last shall be first. Oh, that's so beautiful. God is so good. Let's close out the message. Some Christians believe since they spent so much time, busyness, doing this, running here, running there, doing this, oh, I did all this. They feel they should be first in the kingdom of God. That is a very dangerous place very dangerous place. We are called to be thankful and remember that we all were once, I remember this, you should, on a path to hell. Everyone prior to the regeneration, be it born again, whatever you prefer, salvation, so on and so forth, was on that path. It's, it's simple. The word of God is pretty simple when we look at and break it down. All right. While been on Put the Lord above, that means our jobs. You all know this, family, pets. People live for their pets above everything, above everything. I know people that love their pets better than their spouse. It's a fact of life. It's not right, but it's a fact of life. Pets, other things that we put, you know, many times we, we put things above. It happens. We will be cast aside by family and friends when we truly love the Lord. Have you been cast aside by some family and friends because of your walk of faith? Yes, I have been. I've been shunned. I'm okay with that. Rather live and love the Lord than love the world. Amen? Amen. Many times we will cast a family and friends because... Many times, your, your former friends that you, you probably got in trouble with, you got drunk with, you got high with, whatever you did that was wicked iniquity, now you no longer do it. They don't want to be in your presence because they'll feel guilty in doing it. But again, pray for them, love them. The promise Jesus gives to everyone that has forsaken something. All right, what is forsaken? Glad you asked. To renounce or turn away from entirely, to leave or abandon condition. We will no longer serve people or things because we are striving to serve Jesus Christ. The world says some, everyone that has forsaken someone, the word, that has forsaken someone or something, it, says, it doesn't just say people, it says the lands, it says their, you know everything. That if we love that more than we love God, then we certainly haven't forsaken it. But more importantly, it's given us everlasting life. But we are promised, just as Job, who went through more than anyone, lost everything. His children, his wealth, his homes, his, you know, his stores, everything he lost. But God restored it more than he had before. That is the promise to us. If we live, it says, we'll give you up to 100 times more. But more importantly, everlasting life. Real simple. Our love for God, our faith will cost something. That's okay. Some people may turn their back to you. But praise God, we will, listen to this, we will receive far more in our blessings now and when we are in his presence. Many well-known, this, this, is, this is hard stuff, many well-known evangelists 
preachers, teachers, that people, oh man, you know, oh, I went to go see him. This is difficult. Will not be first. I'll tell you right now. Because God has given them their blessings through their ministry, through their fame, and through their wealth. Now let's put a total godly spin on it. The widowed woman that has nothing, that struggles to go to the pantry and have food to eat, but yet she trusts and believes upon the Lord every waking day. Every waking day. She don't curse him. She don't say, why me? She trusts upon him. People look and laugh at her and say, look at her. She believes in a false God, but she knows in her heart. She trusts the king of kings above all because she knows when this life passes, which is very fast, she will be in his presence forever. Amen. She will be first, not last. Amen? Amen? My goodness, God is so good. We've all been given more than we one deserves. We are blessed more than most. We hope in Christ we're blessed more than the world. Maybe not physically or wealth-wise. But spiritually, and the blessings of God are there. My goodness. Lastly, the gift of salvation is available to all, no matter what. All we have to do is trust upon the Lord. People think there's some kind of magic cure, or there's a certain thing you got to do, or there's a certain process, so many steps where I have to take religious classes, or I have to go see him or her. No, all you have to see is Jesus Christ. In your heart. Amen? Amen. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this. God okay, put this on my heart and I struggled with it. I want you to turn to Matthew 22, 1 to 14. And I'm going to read it while you're looking. It's just, it's another parable, but I just want to see how beautiful God truly is. 22, 1 to 14 reads, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like that of a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. They would not come. And again he sent forth another servant, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings were killed, and, and the things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Listen to this. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, and one of the farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took the servants and mistreated them, and spitefully ensued them. And when the king heard thereof, that he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said, He is the servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and many as you shall find bid to this marriage for the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both bad and good and the wedding was furnished with guests and when they came to see the guests and he saw that a man had not had wedding garment and he said unto him friend how's that camest thou to hither not having a wedding garment and he was speechless and he, the king and he said the king to the servant Bind his hand and foot and take him away and cast him in outer darkness and will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Why is this so important? Because it's real simple. Man is given the opportunity. Man, when I say man, mankind, woman, man and woman, all are given the opportunity, the same opportunity to come to the wedding, the feast of the bride, the gift that he has given, that we're called to sup to take the wine, to take the feast and enjoy the feast that is prepared for us. But many, like this parable, will reject him. And they will live forever without his presence. It's just so hard to understand. This God puts my heart. It brings me to tears that people can reject the Savior that I love and worship. And we are called to love and share the truth and the love because people, many people are on this path without hope. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Many will be given the opportunity to come to the feast with the king. And many 
many will reject and they'll wish they didn't. That in itself should be enough for us to share the love with others. Let us pray. Dear Grace, love and Father, we just love you. We thank you that you give us parables with so much meat to them, so much, so much information that it makes us grow, it makes us look, it makes us examine ourselves. And I pray that we don't look at someone else that's a newcomer and say, man, I'm so much better than them. That's what people that don't have Christ do. That's what religious people do. They say they're much better. They've climbed the ladder much higher. There's no ladder. It's Jesus Christ. There's only one way. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And I pray, my prayer is that someone here or someone watching, you're not sure that they would be sure. They would come to you and believe and confess and open their heart. Repent of their past. There's nothing. As the wedding said, good and bad came. We were all bad. We're not always good. But Christ is perfect. We love you. We thank you. And I pray you bless each and every one here. I pray you bless those that are watching, Lord. I pray that today from this moment on, if they don't know you, they do. And I pray if they do know you, that they are striving to be to know you more. Let their hearts be open to your love. We love you. We thank you. We cannot thank you. And we pray that we walk worthy of our calling. In your precious name, in Jesus' name. Amen.